Hi, I'm David Trace with Jalopnik. Um, I just spent much of today driving the 2019 Chevrolet Silverado, the only full-size truck with a four-cylinder engine. And behind me is Kevin Lachansky, Assistant Chief Engineer. We're gonna look at this engine. A four-cylinder and a full-size pickup may sound like sacrilege to some, but the figures speak for themselves. Chevy's 2.7 liter dual overhead cam, all aluminum turbo four, makes 310 horsepower and 348 pound-feet of torque, starting at 1500 RPM. The thing's actually got a few advanced bits of hardware on it, so let's have a look. Here are five things about the Chevy Silverado's new engine. We'll start by looking at the turbo and how packaging it played into Chevy's decision to make this a four-cylinder and not a six. It all comes down to the turbo placement. So once we decided that we were gonna do a turbo engine um, and what we wanted to make for power and torque, it was all about let's design the most efficient turbo that we possibly can. Let's get the placement ideal. Um, you know, when you start to mount the engine, you have to you have to have engine mounts so you can see there's a big four four bolt mount that's right here um, the mount isn't on there but that's where it bolts onto the onto the side of the engine block um, so everything's competing for space and the the four cylinders length um, it allows us to package the engine mount where it wants to be and the turbo where it wants to be so you can so. keep your turbo centered on an inline four Whereas if you had, say, a V6, your, you'd have a, a kind of an interference between your motor mount and your turbo if you wanted that turbo to be right in the center of those three cylinders on each bank. Is that's, that right? That's correct. It allows us to have nice cooling in our exhaust manifolds. Um, it helps us with real fuel economy um, because we're able to cool our exhaust. We have... Um, instead, of you, instead of using fuel to cool it, right? That's, that's, uh, that's one of the things that we're doing here. Yeah. So, again, focusing on torque response, torque capability, and then rural fuel. The electric water pump on this engine is an industry first for a pickup truck. Um, it provides our customers a couple good key benefits. So um, when we first start the engine, we're able to shut the water pump off completely and you're able to run the engine up. A typical water pump is driven off of a crankshaft, so it's turning, it's flowing coolant. What we want to do is we want to get the coolant temperature up as fast as possible. And in colder climates, what that does is it gives the customer really good heater performance. So one of the things that we're doing is we're feeding coolant into the engine here, and then the water is coming right off of the exhaust manifold that's integrated into the cylinder head. So as you can imagine, the exhaust manifold has a lot of heat, um, and we're pulling that high quality, hot water straight off, and it goes right into the heater core right here, so which is heating the cabin. So um, that's one of the modes, but we've got a number of modes um, with our active thermal management system. So it's all about trying to get the engine to cool and put heat where we want it. So one of the other things that we want to do from an efficiency perspective is heat the engine oil. So you can see here, here's a cutaway of the engine oil cooler. This is the engine one, and then right behind it would be the transmission. There's a similar cooler on the transmission that we're able to actively take the, if we're not heating the cabin, we take that same hot water, we run through a coolant control valve here, and we're able to pipe that water. All the hoses are missing on this particular model, but we're able to pipe the water straight into the oil cooler, both oil coolers, and heat the engine up. So what's that do? It reduces friction. It gets the oil good and warm to where it really wants to run for ideal temperatures. Now that's an electric uh, control valve, right? Normally you've got a wax thermostat, but this here is driven by some sort of computer. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if you were to zoom in here, um, it's a tiny bit dark, but you can see there, these are fairly simple valves that are, they're just rotary valves with seals. Um, and there's an electric actuator here. So you can see this is an electric motor. There's a gear set on here and it just turns. So if you think of um, a plastic valve that you can buy at like a hardware store, um, maybe for turning on and off water, um, effectively the same concept where we're just turning the valve open or closed. Um, the computer knows what the temperatures need to be and it opens it and closes it accordingly to get ideal flow and temperatures. So again, efficiency here or heating the cabin. 
Okay. And uh, your your cooling system, you've got a your block and your head are actually separate. They can be they can be separate. Yeah, they are completely separate. So we've got another actuator up here. So this is a module um, that's housing a number of valves. Um, so we've got another valve up here, just one more rotary valve, completely separate, where it's taking the water that's coming out of the block, um, and we can either completely run it closed or completely open, um, or any variation of that, depending on what the block needs. And it's a good question, why would you want to separate the block from the head? Well, the head needs to be cooled um, much more, um, and the block doesn't, so we're able to let the block come up to temperature, um, let the let the friction um, be reduced by having a hotter block. So you'll you'll cool your head um, for cabin performance, uh, for to keep your integrated exhaust manifold, which we'll look at in a second, to make sure that's keeps your turbo cool, and also for your valve seats. Those are the main reasons why you want your head to be cool all the time. Yep. And then um, you know once your cabin warm up is in good shape, that's when you start to flow through the block. Is that right? Once the block is required for cooling. Oh, okay. So, um, once it's warm, the system is constantly monitoring what the temperatures are, and it's adjusting these valves to keep all the temperatures at optimal, as well as the pump speed. In actuality, all the components are fairly simple. So, just a number of simple single stage valves um, that as they rotate, we open up one or close one, and we're able to do a series of uh, of different modes on the thermal management. So again, um, for friction reduction and for uh, proper, proper cooling. From a camshaft perspective, it's always a balance. You can either have a fuel economy cam or a power cam. Um, so typically what you end up doing is a balance between both of those on a fixed cam engine. Um, we've got multiple steps of, um, of options here, and we were able to, to do both. So um, both the fuel economy cam and the, and the high lift performance cam are on this. So if you zoom in here, you can clearly see them. So we've got a, a low lift lobe and then a high lift lobe. Um, they're actually on different timings, as you can see here. And then once we had this hardware in here, we were then able to take it even a further step from an efficiency perspective. We we're able to add a third step and what we do is we turn off the two center cylinders and we go into active fuel management. So the way the system works, you can see in this cutaway here, there's a pin that drops into an axial camshaft. When the pin drops in, the cam slides from AFM, active fuel management, low lift to high lift. So that's what all these actuators are on the top of the engine. The actuators are on the top of the engine. Yep. These are all solenoids that yep. drop down into a, I guess almost almost looks like a worm gear kind of thing. It, it essentially shifts the camshaft axially. So it's actually, um, it's an axial cam. So these have been used in industry, um, printing presses, things like that um, for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no new technology here. Um, but putting it all together and getting three steps is the industry first. Active fuel management means you can drop down to as two cylinders. Yeah, so um, it's kind of neat with a turbo engine. Um, you take the displacement, uh, the turbo is effectively um, almost doubling the performance of the engine. Um, and then active fuel management in this case is taking the, the base engine and, and dropping it down by 50%. Oh, okay. So, we're able to make this engine bigger and smaller with the technology that we have here. And what does that mean? That means um, really efficient performance and, and from making it bigger, fun to drive, uh, great great ability, um, great payload, great towing, all, of the, all the things that we need for a truck. Um, that sort of brings me to, how did you design this um, from a durability standpoint uh, for a pickup truck application. Um, so this, as I understand, this engine is not used in your cars. It, it is similar to an XT4 engine. Some of the components are, but this yep, engine from itself. From an architecture perspective, it is. Um, however, this engine was purpose designed for the pickup truck. The top of the piston is 100% machined. Um, that's done for fatigue resistance. Um, so it makes the piston very strong for high cylinder pressures something we would do on a diesel type piston. Um, also, 
the top ring has a ring carrier. It's a cast in place, cast iron ring carrier. So a traditional naturally aspirated engine, um, the ring would be housed in just aluminum. Um, because of the loading on this engine, again, being very similar to a diesel, we were able to add in the cast iron ring carrier. This is one of the strongest connecting rods that we've done for a gasoline engine. Then it goes into the rod bearing. The rod bearing, um, we have used a tri-metal rod bearing, and that's another technology from diesels. Uh, and that's for good wear resistance, as well as uh, bearing seizure resistance. And then we move into um, the crankshaft, and the crankshaft's a forged steel crankshaft. So really no expense spared in this area. And that's the business end of, of the engine from a durability perspective. There is a, a variable oil pump on this. Yep. Uh, is it, it looks like it's mechanical, but electrically, um, I guess. Elect electrically actuated, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we've, we've got a number of two-step oil pumps in production today um, on many of our engines. At General Motors, what we've gone here is a little a step further again to reduce friction. What we do here is we continuously variable or continuously vary the oil pump uh, for proper displacement and proper oil pressure. So we're only applying the oil flow and pressure that's required based on what the engine demand is, and it's controlled by the computer. So, so we've got a PWM. Um, a PWM oil control valve, which controls the, uh, the, the oil pump in this case. Very similar to a cam phaser um, in how that is controlled. So like that 600 watt um, water pump, you, yep. you essentially, you don't need to flow max all the time. So throttle it back, yep. Yep. it's just, just waste. Yep. That's pretty much it. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome.